Black, Educated, and Broke is a weekly entertainment podcast where we mix hip hop, headlines, and all things ATL into the success of Black millennials in the Black culture. And welcome back to Black, Educated, and Broke. My, I'm bringing back an old school one. I'm bringing back from season one and part of season two, Millennial Uh-oh. Table Talk. Hey. Can I bring that back? Can I bring yeah. that back? Y'all like, where is everybody else? Uh, the crew's kind of split tonight. Uh, and going into the weekend, man. Powerful uh, interviews we're doing today. Uh, I would say this brother needs no introduction, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. Uh, he is, I, I've just seen him all over the place, man, especially with this 2020 election and just the changes here in Atlanta, and of course, we know what Atlanta is. It's, first of all, it's a city uh, too busy to hate, but we're also a very powerful city and moving city. I'm from this city, and I'm going to let him hey. uh, do more of his introduction to tell you about his background, but you have heard this brother on all kind of radio platforms, and he's uh, hosted a few different things, a couple of uh, panels. You uh, you also did the panel for uh, District 5, um, the special election. Saw so you do that panel, excellent panel there, brother. But, uh, Mike, we're just going to put our hands together for this brother uh, joining us for Millennial Table Talk right here on Black Educated and Broke the Podcast. Brother Teos Wynn, welcome, brother. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Man, Yay. your resume, your resume uh, is absolutely, it's admiring. It's amazing, brother. But just just talk about it. Just where, where do you start? I don't even know where to start with you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Well, first, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate being on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Uh, and as far as, I guess, a starting point, right? Uh, I guess we could start with the foundation. Um, I have a foundation here in Atlanta called Perfect Love Foundation, where we do a lot of work. Uh, we focus on three areas, community, education, and advocacy. And uh, more recently, we've been very heavily on the advocacy side of things, which is through our arm, Millennial Civil Rights. Okay. And so Millennial Civil Rights, we started about a year ago, uh, actually on the 55th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Mm-hmm. And so we, we hit the ground run, running, really. Uh, it was in response to a lot of the presidential things that we saw going on at the time, uh, a lot of the division, a lot of the polarization. And we knew that we needed to have a response, but we knew the response had to be bigger than just one person. And so what we wanted to do was have a response that was really based um, from our generational perspective. Right. And so to really address the situations that were going on, address all the issues from a generational perspective and say that, hey, the, the whole perception about millennials is, is not accurate. There are millennials out here who are getting involved, doing the work, Absolutely. as well as Gen Z. And so we want to change the narrative and we want to get the action. Absolutely. So, so let's go to... Uh, we're gonna go get into the foundation, but uh, Millennial Civil Rights Group. So you started it. Um, what what has been the main focus here in Atlanta? Because you, uh, I don't, I don't want to say because a lot of people don't like to say it. I don't know how you feel, but uh, you are a. Uh, I feel like you're one of my spokespersons. Um, it's a it's a group of millennials here uh, in Atlanta who have just taken the lead, especially on the political scene, but as well as just activism. Period. But uh, just talking about it, man. Just, um, uh, just what, what, what have you all been doing? What has been the focus this year? So one of the things to your point, that's been really encouraging to see so many young people getting involved, especially in a space where we're not necessarily traditionally involved right. and as active as what we've seen. I think a large part of that is due to a lot of the, unfortunately, the uh, social unrest that we saw over the summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we saw those tragedies back to back to back, and I think people just had enough. And they were like, I may not know about this process, but I do, do know that change needs to take place. And so what does that look like? How do we create it? How do we sustain it? And so what does that action look like, that direct action specifically? And so um, I think that that propelled a, a larger amount of momentum that kind of has carried us since that time. But the largest issues that we're seeing from criminal justice reform, uh, student debt, uh, on top of the global pandemic and racism, structural and systemic racism that mm-hmm. has uh, revealed itself is not new, but it's just exposed on a different level right now. And so these are some of the issues that have risen to the forefront. And so a lot of our work has been in how do we, one, combat some of these issues. So, for instance, we started a campaign called We Save Us. And the whole point of the campaign was to take accountability, 
saying that, well, hey, we're not waiting on the government. Government, we're not waiting on anybody else to step in and assist. This is on us. All right. And we want to emphasize this message of accountability. So how do we how do we save ourselves? And what we wanted to do was make a, a personal commitment, really, um, based on four things, right? Mm-hmm. So one, committing to wearing masks in public, uh, which at the time was being highly contested. Uh, depending on what your, I, I your was political one. affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> I was one. I wasn't going then, nowhere though, but I was like, do I got to wear this mask in the house? Like for real? <laughs> and that's the thing, right? So people, some people didn't know whether it was a hoax. And then we were getting confusing messaging. <laughs> oh my God. Confusing messaging. Uh, you're silly. Confusing messaging <laughs> from our, our governor, mm-hmm. from state officials. And so people didn't know which side to really lean into. But we wanted people to commit to wearing a mask. Uh, next, we wanted people to participate in both the national elections as well as your local elections. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that people, I think, are more cognizant of now that they didn't necessarily know originally is that most politics takes place on a local level. Most change takes place on a local level. It's not just the big races that you hear about, like the presidential race. A lot of the states have so much power, and a lot of these municipalities and local governments have so much power that affects your day-to-day life. And so we wanted people to take that action. Um, And then additionally, uh, we really wanted people to stand against division, stand against uh, what we're seeing in terms of hatred and just, you know, Mm -hmm. magnifying the differences between us and amplifying racism uh, at such a peak. And so we started that campaign and we ended up getting participation in over 36 states. Mm -hmm. And so people mobilizing, people coming together. And what we saw was there's an appetite for it. So you can't say that there's not an appetite for change. We see it on the news. We saw it in the protests. And we saw it even in that campaign. People are ready for change, and it's that time. So we want to assist in ushering those changes through. Hey, man, that's, that's dope. How can – um and this sounds like we end the interview. We're not in the interview. But how, how can people <laughs> um, uh, get involved, uh, millennials get involved yeah. or be a part of this movement? Absolutely. And so people, anybody who wants to be a part of Millennial Civil Rights can just go to MillennialCivilRights.com mm-hmm. and then they can just sign up to volunteer. Uh, and so we've been getting a lot of people from the website, but then also uh, most people interact with the uh, Instagram page as well. So people will just uh, you know shoot how a message we do. out saying, you know hey. how we do. Quick <laughs> and easy, okay? Slide in the DM. Quick and yes, easy. Question. DM. <laughs> okay. and easy. Slide in the DM for change, right? <laughs> And so people can do that as well on Instagram. And so that's how people have kind of been connecting with us. But, uh, you know, we've been really fortunate with Millennial Civil Rights and just the amount of momentum, to your point, uh, the amount of platforms that it's been on at this point, both national and local, and um, just the ability um, to really jump in and hit the ground running. One thing that we wanted to do initially with this movement was bridge the gap. We felt like there was such a gap and a disconnect between what we always go back to when we talk about the American civil rights movement and yet we're still fighting a lot of the same challenges and issues today. So what was the disconnect and how did we not more or less just continue to build? Baby boomers, they had those (laughs) kids called Gen X and something wrong with them Gen X. (laughs) Yo, they gave it to Gen Z too, so listen. Don't do that, Brian. Leave the babies alone. Right, right. But there was such a disconnect And so Mm -hmm. our thing was, how do we bridge the gap? And so we wanted to leverage the institutional knowledge that existed and was available. And the first person to publicly endorse and send a letter from Washington was actually the late, great Congressman John Lewis. Mm -hmm. And so he was the first person to send a letter encouraging, as he's always done, youth and and younger engagement in the political space. And so we we spoke and got that letter, uh, then talked to Ambassador Andrew Young as well. And so we wanted to leverage that institutional knowledge as well as get the innovative ideals and strategies and that energy from the millennials and Gen Z to really push forward for some of the changes. And so that's how we uh, kind of hit the ground. And that's what's up. So millennialcivilrightsgroup.com or like Maya said, the Instagram page, just slide in the DM. <laughs> slide, <laughs> slide in the DM, man. That, that's good news. Somebody going to answer. <laughs> you, <they're> right. <laughs> We're talking to Brother <laughs> Taos Wynn. And so let's get back to just the foundation period. Uh, Early this week, of course, a uh, major giving Tuesday, uh, the Perfect Love Foundation. Uh, give me, give me more. Tell, tell me how we can get involved with that. Cause t- this is the season, man. So many people are, 
are struggling on on so many levels uh on top of this political movement especially here in georgia but just the this movement i just want to say for the last few years this movement in general with uh millennials at the forefront but your foundation uh what what, what can people do to help that uh, so right now we've had a huge focus on helping uh, underserved communities. Okay. And so for instance, for, for Thanksgiving, we did a collection uh, in which we were handing out uh, turkeys and, and food. And so we want to continue that going. Um, I do believe that there is a lot to be said in terms of the um, ability to make change and all of the need for change right now currently. Mm -hmm. I think um, our goal in this season is to really meet the need head on. So many people are hurting right now from the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so many people are hurting in general, uh, whether it's lack of connectivity, lack of an ability to provide for families. And so we just want to once again, step in the gap, meet the need where it's at, uh, because people are more likely to care about what you have to say when they know that you indeed care about them. And so we want to meet the need first. And then after we do that, now we can look to kind of, uh, amplify messaging and education and all these other kind of things. But more immediately, we just want to, we want to be there for people. We want to show up in a time of need. Uh, the state of Georgia has over 70,000 nonprofits. Like, let that wow. sit, right? Over 70,000 nonprofits. And so there's so many people helping. Our goal through the Perfect Love Foundation is really to help differently. How can we stand out? How can we help in unique ways and bring people together um, to, to really create spaces of hope? And change and so that's kind of been our emphasis right now and like I said we do that through three areas community education and advocacy so like handing out our food was more of a mm -hmm. community efforts we're continuing that through the holidays education we have an after-school program called leading hope in which we're raising and mentoring the next group of leaders and then in addition to that we also have um, the advocacy side that we touched on earlier which is millennial civil rights Really though, seventy thousand. I, I had <laughs> more than that, and that's the thing. Though, how how can because there's so many organizations, but you said you hit it right there. How can you be different? There's so many, and there's some great nonprofits. Uh, I have worked with several uh, here in the city of Atlanta. Continue to work with uh, several now. I'm working with a few now with the um, city of Atlanta COVID relief program. But it's like, how can you be? different and and really bring people together really help people so with that being said how can people uh help out your organization can how can they donate volunteer get involved with perfect love sure so more immediately if people want to uh give whether it's time or resources they can go to perfectlovefoundation.org perfectlovefoundation.org where they can register to volunteer they can also make a donation which is greatly appreciated mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> They can also keep tabs and find out uh, some of the works and initiatives that we're doing in the city. Uh, like I said, during this holiday season, uh, our focus is really going to be on meeting the needs of communities and partnering with other great organizations that are hitting the ground running. And so there are a lot of upcoming events that we'll be participating in, uh, such as continuing the food collection and giveaways, mm -hmm. uh, even with the Canathon. That's something that we've been participating in lately. Um, and last year we participated in as well, where we're collecting literally as many cans as possible in a collaborative effort uh, with Salvation Army dropping off the cans over there. And I think 11 Alive is uh, kind of hosting and facilitating uh, that experience. And so find a way to plug in. There's so many ways. Um, you don't have to start a nonprofit. You don't have to create something from scratch. You can jump in and get involved now. There's so many opportunities. But uh, that's going to be the focus for this season. And then come January legislative session, Millennial Civil Rights will be back in action. Uh, for the legislative session, proposing legislation, uh, writing and drafting it, as well as uh, supporting and pushing uh, for those same changes. Good stuff, man. Yeah, I got the information. Talking to Brother Teo Swin. Uh, this I got to get to some juice now, man. Get it to the juice. Uh, what, uh -oh. Where are you from? Where you born? Born uh -oh. and raised. Juice. juice background. Get to the juice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, the, the personal juice? Okay, okay. Let's let's go go what's there. going on? What, where are you from, let's man? Who there. are you? Who are you? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Okay. So I'm Teos. I do enjoy walks along the beach. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> what beach? Nah, but seriously. So, uh, what beach? Beach time beach. Wow. Man, he, said, um, he said the white no. sands. He's, uh, he's the, the <laughs> Gulf Coast. The, the white sands are the wow. real beaches, you know? The earth. Wow. Man, maybe we got to pick one. 
Have a good day, Mike. <laughs> <But> no. <laughs> you said the beach. I'm trying to get into the tea. <laughs> you get into the tea. Okay, cool. Okay, let's go. <laughs> but no, I'm a Georgia native. I was born here. I was born in Georgia. And then I grew up, my father was uh, military, army. So we moved around immediately. Okay. I was born here at six weeks old. I was on a plane and moving mm. to Central America. And so I spent some time in Panama and Central America, oh. moved around a bit. Um, and so bounced around to a couple of different states from North Carolina, Kansas, Tennessee. Uh, and then we settled back down here. Um, my family did most of the moving before I was born. Um, and they went to like Germany, France, all the cool places, right? So right. Uh, by the time they had me, we bounced around a little bit and then uh, settled back down in Georgia going into like fifth grade. So I've been back in Georgia uh, the majority of my life. But gotcha. yeah, what I was city? Born what here. city? Drop the city. Uh, in terms of being born or coming back? Coming Georgia. back. Coming back, we moved to, initially we moved to Smyrna first in Cobb. Oh, he, was over, he was over in Cobb. Uh -huh. My hill around, my that's your side. neck of the woods, huh? It's my side. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, yeah, this, we were, we were okay. over in Smyrna, man. Oh, uh, man. So, I mean, quickly, because uh, they got, we've got five minutes. That's plenty of time, man. The uh, election, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we we uh we made some history, man, with this uh presidential election and now um this Senate race. How important? Because we we know local elections are are very important. We've uh we've been voting on that, especially in Fulton County. I feel like I done voted twenty times. I'm like, how much paper <laughs> are we gonna wait? If I print out something else one more time, literally the <laughs> district uh we just did the district five uh, special election runoff. And I had to print right. something out and go scan that. Then I had to go back to the table because I live in District 39 for the state Senate seat for the chemo seat. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back right. and go back to the kiosk, print another paper and scan it. And I'm like, y'all know we wasting a lot of paper. Full time, we could have had a barbecue, got people registered to vote. I would have did all the cooking. I don't mind cooking for a lot of people. But that was a lot of paper. But this Senate race, man, uh, I mean, just how important must Georgia get out and and just cast their right and use their right to vote. And right now, Georgia, we have to come out. It is our responsibility to come out. We have to show up and we have to show out because literally the balance, the ability for this new administra administration that we all were encouraging and all wanting to push forward, mm -hmm. the Biden-Harris ticket, in order for them to successfully be able to accomplish and push forward the objectives that they want to, they're going to need the Senate majority. Right. And it would just so happen that all eyes, the whole world, the nation is watching Georgia right now. And so, okay. Georgia, we have to show up. Over 940,000 people have requested absentee ballots at this point. And so we have to show up to the polls. Uh, we have to vote in because this is going to allow us now to push forward that meaningful legislation that we were talking about earlier when we talk about criminal justice reform when we talk about addressing the student debt crisis when we talk about the environmental crisis and climate change mm -hmm. and so all these things if we want to affect change then we have to come out we have to continue we need not only the people that voted the first time but we need all those who didn't even vote the first time who have never engaged in the political process right. to get involved and so it's going to be significant uh, we need everybody to show up for sure in the state, the beautiful state of Georgia. That's right. We need you. That's Absolutely. Right. Hey, uh, so if Keisha go to D.C. next year, uh -huh. you running for mayor? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you throwing your hat? You going in the ring? You running mayor? Am, am I running for mayor? My, I'm trying to get the juice. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see who I'm running next year. Listen, once Keisha say once, once, uh, my that's mayor, the wrong question. my mayor, uh, <laughs> my longtime family friend. That's Auntie. Once when Keisha says she's going to DC, <laughs> I need to know who throwing a hat in the ring. Not asking the right questions. <laughs> We're trying to see if there's a first lady. We're trying to see where. Oh wow! Is there a first from. lady? Like, you know what, Maya? It's time to go to break. <laughs> it is time. <laughs> That's the tea. Okay? It is time to go to break. Wow. Man, my brother, we appreciate you joining us. Like I said, we did a throwback, man. Millennial Table Talk, uh, great information. Um, uh, Perfect Love Foundation, Millennial Civil Rights Group. Uh, he gave you the information. Brother, how can uh, people follow you, uh, reach you on social media so they can know what you're doing, where to go, where to be at? Like you said, we got the rest of the holiday season and even into uh, 2021, even with a new administration so many people still need help still need assistance how can they follow you 
Sure. Well, first, I really appreciate once again, you all for having me. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And for those of you who do want to follow and connect with me, please feel free to do so at Taos Win on all social media platforms. That is at T-A-O-S-W-Y-N-N. And you can connect with me there. But um, more importantly, I definitely appreciate y'all having me today. Hey, thank you, brother. This is uh, an old school throwback millennial table talk. And we're right here on Black Educated and Broke. Hey, man, grab your phone, grab your mama phone, grab your auntie and your granny phone and tell them to follow us on Instagram as well as Facebook. And that's going to be at Black Educated and Broke. We also on YouTube, y'all. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And follow us on Twitter at B-E-B podcast underscore ATL. Now, if you forget, I'm about to kick your ass. Ooh, not the A. All right. We in the A.